Okay. Okay, then let's do it. All right, go for it, IT. Good evening and welcome to the Community Service Commission. Uh, this is February 16th and it's 6 p.m. Um, be due to COVID, of course, we are meeting via Zoom or web. So anyone that had questions did need to submit them prior to the meeting to the city. Can we start this evening with the Pledge of Allegiance? And uh, Commissioner Gonsowski, would you lead us, please? Where are you? I was muted. Okay. Okay, here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, can we call Kate? Commissioner Gonzowski? Here. Commissioner Roof. Present. Commissioner Reesh. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Commissioner Vecchioni. Commissioner Vecchioni. Oh, Josh, you muted yourself to talk. There you go. Here. Perfect. Yeah. Vice Chairperson Allen. Present. Chairperson Avery. Present. All commissioners are present. Okay. All right, we'll start with the consent calendar. Does anybody have anything you want to take out, remove from the con consent calendar? Item number three. Okay, item number three. Anyone else? Okay, great. So we're pulling item number three. And then we'll go ahead and would somebody like to uh, move that we pass the minutes or approve the minutes? I make a motion that we pass the consent calendar of those items that haven't been pulled as written. I make a second. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll have a vote on it, uh, starting with Commissioner Gonsalski. Aye. Commissioner Reach. Aye. Commissioner Roof. Aye. Commissioner Zichion. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Allen. You're muted, Kathy. Unmute. Aye. And myself, Commissioner Avery. Aye. It's passed. Okay, and then we can go right into the library. Do you want to do the library and cultural services, Mark? We have item number three to go back to on the consent calendar, please. Item number three, the uh, Recreation Center's monthly report. And Ron, did you pull that? Yes, I did. And I just want to thank staff for actually updating the, the graphs that I requested last meeting by actually putting exactly what they stood for. Much appreciated. I'd be amiss if I didn't thank you for doing something that I asked you about. Thank you. That's it. With that, I'd like to go ahead and approve consent calendar item number three. Is there a second? Second it. Okay, once again, the vote. Commissioner Gostowski? Aye. Commissioner Reach? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Commissioner Vecchione? Aye. Commissioner Allen? Aye. Commissioner Avery? Aye. It's passed. 
Okay. Now we go into the library and cultural services update, Mark. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, so uh, just quickly, um, last at the last meeting, uh, Commissioner Roof uh, asked for some updated numbers on our uh, overdrive um, digital book checkouts. Uh, and I wasn't able to get the numbers in time to submit with the packet, but I do have updated numbers and I will tell them to you tonight and then I'll submit the report uh, for next month's meeting. So um, we're comparing um, the pandemic period, the library closure time with uh, the, the same period of time the previous year. So it's um, March through the end of uh, January for 2019-2020 um, and then 2020-2021. Um, so the number of digital checkouts um, from 2019 and 2020 was 65,114. And for the same period the following year um, was 100,164. That's a 54% increase. Um, over the same period the year before. So a significant increase in our downloadable book usage, um, largely attributable to the pandemic and uh, you know, uh, not having the same amount of in-person services available. So wanted to update you, like I said, I'll include the, the report in the next month's packet, but uh, just wanted to give you those numbers. And then, um, just to highlight a couple of things from the report, we have um, we have received another grant from the California State Library. This one is called Give Me Space, and it's a, a STEM-based grant um, for uh, space uh, programs. Um, it's called a copycat grant, which means it's a grant that's been successfully implemented in another library and the state has made funds available for other libraries to um, adapt and implement it in their own locations. So um, that's about a $12,000 grant, I believe. And um, to kick it off, we're doing a Moon Over Mission Viejo virtual exhibit, and um, we're requesting uh, residents to submit their photos of the Moon Over Mission Viejo, and those will be on display in a virtual gallery starting in March. So there's still time to get submissions in, and I included um, the link for that. Um, but please encourage people that you know, um, if you've got some budding photographers among your friends or family, um, have them submit a photo. We'd love to you grow that exhibit and I know we've been getting some great submissions so far so we're really excited about that. Um, we're partnering with Help Me Grow Orange County um, to host a free virtual workshop series for parents of uh, children aged one to five. This is part of our early learning programming. Um, so uh, starting on thurs Thursday, um, they're doing a, a one workshop per week um, these are free to parents and um, they're just great sort of developmental programs. This is our first time partnering with Help Me Grow. So, you know, we'll see how that goes, but um, we've been getting a good response to that so far. Um, wanted to highlight our Tutoring with Character program. This is uh, the Teen Character Committee um, put this together. And um, one of the things that we had noticed um, in our own offerings through um, our homework help and our online tutoring is that uh, they didn't have uh, good options for really the younger kids, the um, elementary, especially early elementary kids. And so um, but when the teens approached us about wanting to do a tutoring program, we suggested that they, um, that they do that. They've been getting a really good response. It's been growing every week. Um, the teens are doing a great job and I just have to give props to our teen committee because they put together such an impressive proposal for the program. They really thought it out. They did research. They had a whole plan of how they would um, promote and market it um, and then an evaluation period um, so that they could evaluate the success, make changes and everything. So um, I was just really impressed with uh, this group of teens and the thought and care that they put into the proposal and it's really paying off um, in terms of the, the numbers that they're getting week by week. So um, 
you know, the, that's been a, a great opportunity for them. And then uh, lastly, you've probably seen some photos around, but um, a number of our staff are now working um, shifts at the uh, county points of distribution for the vaccine. So in fact, I had my first shift on Friday. Um, it's a great experience. And the, the city manager has been encouraging um, city staff to uh, take this opportunity and volunteer as we're able. Um, and, you know, during our, our work week, we currently, as of the report, I think we had 14 staff members volunteering. We're up to 17 now. Um, and everybody is uniformly reporting. It's just been a fantastic experience. Um, they're very grateful for the opportunity and to be able to do something that's really practical to help um, you know, move through the pandemic. And um, the people are so grateful um, and it's, it's just been a really great experience. So I wanted to, to highlight that. And my video just went dead. I hope you can still hear me, see me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we can see you. Thank you. Okay, that's is, it for me. What is the deadline for the submissions for the Moon Over Mission Viejo? Uh, I believe the deadline is March 2nd. Hold on, my screen is acting really wonky. So let me see if I can. It's March 7th at 5 p.m. There we go. Yeah, it's it should be in the report, but I can't see anything on my screen right now, unfortunately. Yeah, so <laughs> it is, Yeah, it does say March 2nd at 5 p.m. Okay, thank you. Could I send a, a picture of my um, favorite breakfast from Denny's, Moon Over Miami? <laughs> does, that, does that count? Or? Give it a try. I'm not the one okay. who's uh, evaluating the okay. submissions, but no. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to make that clear. Okay. okay. And the Recreation and Community Services update. That's me. I'm not following Genesis. What am I saying? I always follow Genesis. All right. Thanks, Genesis. Uh, Recreation and Community Services report. I'm just going to highlight on a couple of things because I'm sure you guys have all read this, but a couple of things that I'm pretty proud of that the staff have been able to accomplish uh, and give out some credit is uh, LIDI, the SNAP initiative, the Special Needs Adaptive Programming, and the Therapy Lanes. That one has uh, been a new component that we've added to our initiative and the cool thing about that is in the report you'll see that we've offered you know about a, as of a week ago 2716 swim hours uh, towards this program and so the individuals are able to come in they're able to float they're able to do their water walking uh, and other therapeutic uh, recreation in the pool and uh, Lydia and I'm sure we'll share with you at some point but she's been a, um, going around and getting some feedback from the participants and some testimonies and stuff, which is pretty cool to hear the experiences that they've had and why they need this therapy and how, in some cases, how the pool is saving their lives and making them uh, live uh, an independent lifestyle. So really cool, really proud of her and her staff for helping to facilitate this program. Uh, I'm also extremely excited uh, with the efforts on Drew, with Drew and his staff for doing the monthly activities over at the Norman P. Murray Center. You know, with our Murray Center being closed for almost a year now, we've, we've lost connection with many of our older adults in the community. And so for the staff over there to come up with these creative things, even though it's just once a month, um, to get them engaged and to come by and even just to wave and stuff like that. I just always get excited to see what the next theme is going to be, what the new activity is going to be. So in the report, you've got the crushing on our seniors with candles and uh, candies and candles. And then they also did, and some of you were there for the parking lot trivia activity. And then you'll see that we have some other activities coming up for uh, St. Patrick's Day and stuff like that. But really excited for them to be able to do some of this programming and get our seniors out and say, hey, we miss you, basically. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight was uh, that our aqua aerobics classes are back at Sierra. So when we went into the stay-at-home orders, we canceled those programs. But now that we're back into the tiered system, 
Lydia and her staff was able to bring that program back and uh, it's also popular, it always sells out and stuff like that. So again, just a great opportunity. A lot of people in there uh, are older adults, so it's good to have something in the community where they can go and participate in a safe manner. And across the board at all of our facilities, extremely proud of the staff for, you know, it, again, almost being a year here where we've had to clean chairs and benches and wipe things down and stuff, and they're sticking with it for the safety of our patrons. And it's just incredible the drive that they have with that. And it's recognized by the people that come into our facilities. They show uh, great appreciation for all their effort with notes, with boxes of chocolate, you know, whatever, high fives, no high fives, high, high air fives, no touching. Um, but it's just cool to see the feedback that they're getting and, and the appreciation that they receive. Uh, and then I'll just add a little bit. It's always nice to see the ones that add the line Oh, and we used to go to the YMCA, but now we're coming over to the recreation centers because you guys do it so well. So it's just like they've got a great program over there, but apparently you know, the community has spoken. We're a little bit better. And so they're coming to us. And that's due to her and the staff there at the recreation and tennis center. So kudos to all of them. That really concludes my staff report for this month, if, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Well, last week I did go over and dance for the ladies again, you know. <laughs> but this time I had a suit on, so it was a little awkward. Oh, that, that was probably good that you wore the suit. Okay, thank you, Mark. Do you want to go right into the Recreation and Community Services programs? Yes, I do. All right. Fred so, sorry. So this is uh, the next item, of course. And this comes about as we begin to plan our budget for the next two year cycle, as we make modifications to our current fiscal year. And, you know, in individual conversations with many of you, you've had um, different questions about, you know, our staffing, our facility hours, the programs and services and, and things like that. So I thought this, I would give you this kind of overview of the department and kind of walk you through it. It's going to be long. I'm sorry. There's just a lot of information. Uh, so sit back, take notes, whatever you need. Uh, if you have a question, I would ask though that you use the chat because I can't see everybody on here uh, or just speak up and tell me to stop and I'll be happy to answer you. But I'm going to kind of break it down into a couple sections and maybe I'll stop at the end of each one. Uh, but first I'm going to go over, you know, our staffing uh, and then I'll follow that up with our facility hours and then highlight the capital improvement projects that are kind of waiting out there to be funded and move forward. And then the big ticket item is gonna be the program services and events, that uh, spreadsheet that I emailed you to kind of look over and see. This isn't an action item tonight. This is just an FYI. This is just information. We would love any feedback that you have, or if you have questions, please ask us. I'll count on Drew and Liddy um, and myself to answer those for you. Um, but it's gonna help us give us some information as we move forward uh, to get your perspective and to get your recommendations and things like that as we put together our budget or even after the fact, as we slowly start to bring some of these things back. There's unfortunately the magic light switch where we just flip it back on and all the money's back, all the programs are back, all the people are back. So we're gonna take it cautiously and we'll see where we go. So here we go. So I said we would start first with our uh, staffing. I'm going to share my screen with you to kind of give you an overview of what our department looks like. Let's see how easy this is. Okay, it should be pulling up our department organization. Can I get somebody to say yes, you see it? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. So it's kind of tight because we are a rather large department. What you'll see at the top in green, that would be me. Uh, and you can see that I'm the liaison for the Community Services Commission, have some functions there. And then as you work down the chart, it identifies all the different positions uh, that we have in the department uh, and some that we don't. And that's what I'm going to cover with you today. So back in 2016, 2017, we contracted out with management partners, which is why their logo's on here do an evaluation of the programs and services and the facilities uh, that we had under the Recreation and Community Services Department. 
So in doing the research, they met with staff, they and some of the commissioners may have even been involved with this. I don't remember if it, uh, I don't know if any of the commissioners that were involved with this are still on here. I don't know, or maybe you're back. Um, but during that time, we talked about everything that we were doing and the intent there was to make sure that our organizational chart was in line with what we were trying to provide for the community. So this is what they came up with. So if you look here, there's 27 full-time positions. Now, not all of them are 40 hours a week. There's some that have been modified uh, or reduced rather to like 30 hours or 37. Um, but there's 27 bodies, full-time staff that are benefited and are part of the team. With this proposal that they came back with, it shows the 27, but I'm gonna highlight this one right here. This is the facility maintenance leader which was a proposed full-time staff. At the time, we couldn't increase our staffing, so those duties were absorbed by Drew Fine. So although this says 27, our department has only been uh, 26 full-time staff. So where are we now uh, with COVID? Uh, this was our, let me go back. This was our goal to try to get our department to look like this and with the different functions. Because there's been so many years, uh, between when this was done and now some of the programs and events have changed or we haven't quite finished this organizational chart. So they might be in other places. So don't try to figure out who they are and stuff like that, but just look at the, you know, kind of the outline here. So like I said, the facility maintenance leader position was never created uh, based on the recommendation. So we have 26 full-time staff. Since then, we've had promotions, we've had retirements, we've had you know, shifting positions and things like that. And right before COVID, we had a couple people leave and we did some internal promotions and then COVID hit and that stopped all the recruitment uh, for us. So where we are as of today, I'm gonna highlight the positions that uh, we've either lost because they've gone somewhere else in the city based on the needs of the city or they're currently vacant, okay? So in this first tier here, we have uh, the admin assistant. So this was Caitlin's old position before she recently got promoted. So this position is currently vacant. As we go down to the supervisor level, we have uh, one supervisor position that is vacant and that is uh, our athletic supervisor. And currently Marcelo is filling in for that who usually helps or manages the rentals over at the Murray Center and uh, saddleback room, things like that. But our athletic supervisor is right here. So that one is vacant. We also just did an internal promotion for our senior services supervisor, uh, which is great. So we've got five of our six supervisors in place. But moving down to the coordinator level, we were not able, we aren't able to fill the coordinator position that was just promoted. So that's going to be right here, this coordinator position uh, is currently frozen. We also have, let's see, that's three, I gotta keep track of these. So one, two, three. And we also have two other positions. We have a coordinator position, which was created when Sam Cho retired under our tennis component. And then we also have a specialist over at Montanoso that is still vacant. So that's five vacancies, but we have really six because this department assistant right here, that position was eliminated. So this position is gone and the other five are currently vacant and on hold. So if we have 26 people in our staff and six gone, we're down to 20 full-time staff positions uh, that are still trying to provide services and programs to the community. On top of this, we have our HSTs as well. So when COVID uh, came about and we started closing down all of our facilities, uh, we did everything we could to not let go of any staff and we didn't furlough any staff. So the HSTs are still or we're still and are still on our books. We just haven't been able to schedule them. So nobody's been fired, nobody's going to be fired. 
Nobody's going to be let go. The HSTs are all still with us. As we've slowly opened up facilities, we've been able to bring some of those HSTs back. You've probably seen them at the tennis centers and the recreation centers to help uh, facilitate uh, the modified hours that we're operating, as well as the additional duties which we brought on to help clean the courts after each use and some of the fitness equipment and just some extra help on the deck with uh, operating our aquatics uh, programs. So where we are today with our HSTs, uh, we've reached out to all of our HSTs to see who's interested in coming back uh, as shifts were available. Uh, for our pools, all of our lifeguards who were able to come back have come back and showed interest in coming back. They've all come back. Our front desk staff, HSTs, um, you know, some of them for various reasons, you know, when we were shut down, they either found another job and so they're no longer interested in coming back. Some of them are older and they aren't comfortable in coming back yet. But pretty much all of the individuals that are interested in coming back as of today uh, at our front desk, at our recreation and tennis centers, uh, we've been able to have shifts for them and get them back. Now with the Murray Center still closed, we've reached out to those HSTs and um, because the building's closed, we haven't been able to offer them any shifts. Some of them, however, we have been able to bring back and use elsewhere in the department. Uh, we have a few that are interested in working shifts at the tennis and recreation centers. So. As positions, as spots become available, we start to bring those HST, HSTs back. So that's kind of where we are to set the tone staffing wise. Uh, as we plan our budget with our reduced staffing, just because we're trying to conserve budget resources and stuff like that, we're not able to fill those vacancies. Um, that may hinder us bringing some of our programs and services back and expanding hours at our facilities. Does anybody have any questions on staffing right now? Otherwise, I will proceed. No. I'm going to keep going now into facility hours. Let me see if I can switch screens here. Hey, Mark, I have a question. Sure. Can you, can you send us that sheet with no. the... Okay. <laughs> You want the, the organizational, the, yes. the sheet or org yes. chart? I can do a mock-up of it. I don't want to send you this one because, again, all the programs and stuff are mixed up. There's stuff on there like the Uniqlo uh, tournament that we no longer do. But No, you know, but it's good. I, just I want to see the pecking order because I've never really seen that sheet before. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay, I can do that. Okay. Thank and you. I can do it. I can drop in names, too. Uh, okay, so let's share the next screen here, which is our hours. Start from beginning. All right, so here's our recreation and tennis center hours, our facility hours. Obviously, the Norman P. Murray Center is not open, but we'll start with here. So this shows kind of what we were doing pre-COVID and where we are currently. So at the Montanosa Recreation and Fitness Center, we're operating at a modified schedule of 52% uh, of the hours that we were originally prior to. COVID. So you can see the difference above and below that Monday through Friday, we were 5.30 to 9 and Saturday and Sunday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and it's, thank you, Libby, for doing this, but she, and she put the, the total hours there that we were open, 101.5 hours. So during COVID, what we were able to open back up, you can see it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1 to 7, Tuesday, Thursday, 6 to 8, Saturday, 7 to 2, and then on Sundays, we were closed, so 53 operating hours. And I'm not going to go through all the hours for Sierra, but it's very similar, uh, same setup here. But what I want to point out is that we're only operating Sierra at 41%. For Marguerite and Felipe, we're doing a little bit better, uh, more than half. So we're at 63 and 62% operating uh, hours at each of those facilities. And you can see that prior to COVID, the Marguerite uh, Tennis Pavilion was operating at 94 hours, and now we're at 59. And Felipe was at 61 hours, and now we're at 38. 
And this was probably Felipe was the last one that we increased our hours at. That was to get some evening play for sand volleyball and also pickleball uh, over there in the evenings because we were only offering pickleball during the mornings. So we had some requests for evening play. And so that's what we were able to get. So moving on, uh, one thing we would like the commission to think about is, you know, if our budget is indicating that we are trying to save staff resources and uh, to keep programs going and services citywide, not just in our department, we're probably not going to be able to modify our hours anytime soon. It's, it's what we've got is what we've got. But we'll be able to tell and inform you more as we go through the budget process and see if there's any opportunity for us to make changes one way or the other. We may need to reduce some hours. We may get the opportunity to increase hours. Um, but right now we're just trying to stay at status quo. So with that, as we plan to move forward and we come out of COVID and based on um, budget, we have some samples here of uh, opportunities that we can do. This might be a good, well, this has been a good opportunity for us to evaluate usage and trends that we had pre-COVID and make some modifications. So one option here is a seasonal approach, which basically takes Montanoso and Sierra and breaks it up uh, into two different seasons. So you've got April 1st through October 31st, and you'll see there that the proposal is to do 89 operational hours. Uh, we would be open Sunday mornings. We would be open pretty much a full day on Saturday. And then Mondays would still open at 6 a.m. but close at 8 p.m. Uh, this, of course, uh, kind of shaving off the tail end of the days when it starts the, the traffic in the facilities starts to reduce. Um, this is also our most popular time frame is spring, summer, and fall, early fall. So that's when we would want to operate the most hours or offer that to the community at 89 operating hours. Then if you shift to your right, you're looking at November 1st through March 31st. And this is where we can make some additional savings. So you can see the overall operating hours is 72. Sierra would be at 67. Uh, and you can see that again, in the evenings, we try to um, close down earlier. Uh, it's dark, it's cold, the usage goes down. Uh, and this would be an opportunity. There are people that still use the facilities beyond those hours pre-COVID. It's just the numbers, you know, we have um, just a few in there at a time. This is, this is the heavy traffic times. That's why this is being proposed. So that's one option. Option two is uh, eliminating low use hours year round. So Montanoso and Sierra, you would see we would go to, we're proposing a 79 hour operation. Again, uh, we would cut close earlier in the evening, Monday through Friday, and then we'd shave some time off on the weekends a little bit too. And then a quick look at Marguerite and Felipe if we went with the year-round approach there. So 79 hours for Marguerite and 79 hours for Felipe. So are there any questions on what we're currently doing? Do you have any Initial thoughts on something you'd like to see as we come out of this, any priorities? And this isn't stuff that you need to share tonight. If you have questions outside of the meeting, please ask, or if you have thoughts outside, you can do it there. But we're here, so if you have any thoughts, we'd love to hear. Mark, are these hours, do they have a good correlation with what the private sector is offering? Uh, Liddy, I don't know if you can jump in here. and. Exactly. Yeah, um, we when we did our research, we did two things. One, we looked at our records of obviously our low use and traffic, but we also went to see what 24 hour fitness was doing as far as shaving off hours, lifetime fitness, uh, uh, fitness 19, and um, there was one more LA fitness. So we did look at other gyms and YMCA, and really it's the same thing. It's as, it's really according to they did the same thing, cutting off those hours at the end of the night. Those gyms that were open until 9 or 10 p.m. were looking more at a 7 to 8 p.m. slot for closing. Almost no gyms uh, were opening before 5 a.m. Um, and so we, we looked at both opportunities there to see what people were doing. 
Thank you. I'd, I'd like to say, Mark, that of the two options, I'd rather personally see option two, because at least it's the same hours for all your participants, so they know what the hours are, because thinking, what time of the year am I? You're also going to get the people that come after they work. I realize six is people before they go to work, but if you're going to cut the hours off at six, um, if I remember the other option, but then on option two, you look like it was 7 p.m. year round. I just think it's it's easier for our members to, to know when it's open, when it's closed. There you go. That was just my, my thought. All right, so it would be more consistent keeping the hours at. It's not something you have to remember. Okay, fair enough. Is there anybody else that has any questions or initial thoughts? No pressure. All right, well, hearing none, I will move on. We can always come back to it if you go, aha, I've got this great idea. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen and I'm gonna move into Uh, the CIP. I'm going to jump ahead to the CIP. This was one of the attachments in your report. And so I want to quickly highlight some of the projects just so you're aware of them and uh, where we are. So again, two years ago when we brought this before the Community Services Commission, we went and we visited many of these sites. We talked about it. I think we talked about it at a couple meetings, actually, at the commission meeting. There was uh, public input. People came and you know promoted whatever uh, facility they were participating in and why we should do it. Based on your recommendations, this is what we actually took to the council for them to consider uh, and adopt. One of the interesting things that I wasn't planning on taking to the council was, but the commission wanted to make sure that this, uh, that their recommendation was that this was the list and to pick it off one at a time until the list was exhausted and not to change it. So when we took it to the city council, they, uh, they liked it. They've used this as a tool. They haven't necessarily solidified it as, yes, this is our master plan for CIP projects and chip away at it, but they have kind of used this as a tool. At the, the council level, they did have some public input, and at that time, they made a couple of changes, which I think I noted in the report. One of them was to uh, bump up the Marty Russo Youth Athletic Park. That got brought up to number five, and they did add in shade structures at some of our parks, I think as number six. Since this report was, uh, well, in the last two year budget cycle, some of these have been completed. Number five, Craycraft Park, um, not necessarily expanding the parking, but the restroom rather snack bar was renovated, and some of you were there at the reopening of that. And I believe at the Marty Russo Youth Athletic Park, they did do some initial work on the lighting to add lights down there at the remaining parks. I think they did um, a plan, so at least it's in place. So when funding would become available, they would have um, whatever they needed in place to actually implement that. So going from the top, we've got Montanoso. This, uh, as some of you have seen on the tours and are familiar with the facility, you know, the pool's in pretty bad shape. There's stains on it, there's you know, plastering and tile is coming off, things like that. So that was the number one selection. Moving down, we had the fitness equipment, replacing the fitness equipment and the flooring surface. And then three was Sierra. So at the time when we went to council, we said, you know, if there was enough funding to do both Montanoso and Sierra, we would of course offset them. We wouldn't do both projects at the same time because we wouldn't want them both shut down at the same time. And during each project, we would address the fitness equipment at the corresponding uh, time. So if we shut down Montanoso, we would also do the fitness equipment. And then Sierra, we would do the fitness equipment. The fitness equipment was not going to be a, a separate item. At the Murray Center, we talked about, oh, I'm sorry. And we also completed this with the exception of the sound system. So the, recently with the COVID closure, we were able to do the flooring. We did some painting, a bunch of miscellaneous repairs throughout the facility. Uh, I think most of you have seen it. If you haven't, let me know. 
uh, and we can get you over there to check it out. It looks really nice. Uh, there's new, uh, some new end tables and plants and lights and stuff. It really, when, when we finally do open, it's gonna look uh, very clean. It's gonna look somewhat new, it'll be exciting. So we're really excited to eventually open those doors. Uh, the parking expansion, so because of Craycraft Park, uh, it's just got a small parking lot is all I can say. So the thought is if you're at Craycraft Park and you look beyond the padding cages, there's this dirt um, land that goes up to a reservoir. And so that land is owned by the city and it's really part of that park. So the thought was to add a parking lot in that general area near the volleyball courts and beyond the uh, not dugouts, I just batting cages uh, to increase capacity there because we do get people for especially when tournaments are hosted there that they go up into the neighborhood and they park and then we get complaints from the neighbors. Uh, we also, you know, back now we're getting, you know, more people coming to see a kid. You got grandparents and all that stuff and it just eats up the parking uh, really quick. Uh, the neighborhood, not only the neighbors, but the businesses across the way have also hired security to protect their lots, especially on weekends, so people aren't parking there and walking over, and then they can't get people to come eat at the restaurant because there's no parking. Moving on, we had the Norman P. Murray. There was a need for an individual handicap accessible restroom, and this is important because right now, with when we have um, older adults come in and they have they need assistance, well, if they're not the same gender, they we have to go and basically stand guard outside the restroom and shut it down so that they can take that individual in and help them in the restroom. Or we have to send them out of the building and there's that playground, uh, the restroom near the playground where we encourage them to go there. And it's just, it would be nice to have an individual use restroom in the Murray Center with that, those types of situations can be handled and we don't have to take staff away from what they're doing. Uh, and it's somewhat embarrassing to have to ask and do those types of things. So this again, allows them to use it freely, no issues. Pavion Park, you've seen it renovated, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Uh, very popular. The biggest request we get for that park now that restrooms are there is to add a picnic shelter for birthday parties and stuff like that. There just isn't anywhere to get away from the sun over there quite yet. So that's been a big request. We added new bocce ball courts and uh, the, we've had the bocce ball club indicate that they would like to have some additional courts so that they're able to do uh, tournaments and regional events there. Can't do it with just the two courts. From a recreational standpoint, the two courts are fine for just general use, but if we wanted to host any events or programs there, uh, they really need some more courts. Then moving down to Felipe, there was a phase two, which we never got to. In phase one, we renovated the whole facility. We added, we got rid of the golf shack that was out there. It was one of the original buildings at that facility, wiped that out, and we added a new office with a small community room. We added restrooms for the users of the facility, and then we also added uh, restrooms as part of the park master plan, uh, the restroom park master plan, so that they face the parking lot. So park users over at Cordova could come over and use the restroom. It's been a big hit, very popular. It's great. As part of that project, we've plumbed the whole facility to add another community room that would be craned in, pre-made, craned in, and dropped in so that we can use it as more of, uh, you know, for classrooms, for after school uh, programs, for rentals, baby showers, you know, whatever you wanna have there uh, and create a really unique space. And that would go in the back, there's kind of a, I'll call it a gazebo looking structure. And that's the footprint of the new building that would go in there. And then once that building's in there, that would complete that minus some court renovations. At Marty Russo, we talked about additional ball field lights. We've also, the, some, the commissioners, some of the commissioners that have been on for a few years saw the uh, lake loop connectivity. That's part of the bike master plan and connecting the Oso Creek Trail all the way to the lake so that you can take it, go around the lake. Uh, Marty Russo, at, there's uh, plans to put in an additional restroom. There's only one restroom in that park. Anybody that's been down there, it's, it's a rather large park. And if you have uh, a child that's playing and needs to go to the restroom on this side of the park and have to get to the restroom and back, it just 
the demand is there. I'll leave it at that. Uh, we've had public input to add a playground at La Mancha Park. Uh, that's right up uh, this, well, it's on La Mancha above the um, Mission Viejo Country Club. Sage shade structures we talked about earlier that got bumped up to start considering adding a, a shade element at each of our parks and with any future park renovations. The World Cup Soccer Center, the parking lot lights there, some are missing. Um, so we need to uh, replace those. And then, you know, I could go on each of these, but number 17 is install a trail between the Pataki Center and the Murray Center. So if you're at the Murray Center right now, you can walk down on the trail, Oso Creek Trail, and get there. But there's nothing along the top side that takes you along the soccer fields and softball fields. And, but when you get above the Pataki Center, there's like a zigzag, a zigzag path that you can take down. And the thought there is to connect those two so you're up above um, everything and connect those. So when we do events, the thought is we could have overflow parking at the Pataki Center and they could use that access to get up there. Or if you've ever ridden on one of the golf courts or golf carts, that would be a nice trail back and forth to get you back and forth to events. We did do some improvements on the Lakeside Park. I don't know if this was completely uh, finished, but uh, at the corner of Alicia and Marguerite, we've got we've worked with the lake to take over some of the maintenance there at that location, and all the plants have been replaced. There's a nice new trail down in there. There's seating areas. We have a couple of statues uh, that are there, a war memorial and uh, I think drug prevention awareness uh, statue. Then we get into the La, La Paz dog park improvements, and so some of the the request we get is that the uh, the park is dark at night. Well, that's was intended because we didn't want people there late. So, uh, but there has been requests to put lighting at the park and paving the lot because if you've ever been in there and after you get your car wash and you drive in there, it kicks up dust and then you got to go get a car wash again. Or, um, but that was purposely also done as a way to filter the water going down into the ground before it goes into the arroyo. So. The cost on this is not only paving it, but it's also creating a gutter system and to channel that water somewhere else so it doesn't, you know, the oils and stuff from the street don't go down into the oil. And then it's just some security cameras up there. Uh, the girls softball program requested Craycraft Park to get scoreboards. That's one of the only parks, I think, sports parks that we have that does not have scoreboards currently. And then back to La Paz Dog Park Gate Card Readers. There, there was a big push there for a while to, you know, only residents or, you know, residents should have certain access. And also to make sure that the dogs, you know, to get a gate card, you might have to go down to the animal services or the shelter and make sure your, your animal's licensed before you can get that because they were having some issues up there. So, wow, there's 23 projects that I tried to whip through and give you a little bit of a flavor. Uh, and this is what the council was presented with last week as part of our budget preparation to start thinking like, okay, here's all these projects we still have waiting over here to be funded. Uh, and it's going to be a, a tight year financially. And so we may not even get to any of these um, this next year. One thing I will point out with Montanoso is about, I don't know, six months before COVID hit, we did increase our not even six months, I think we did it at the beginning of the year. Uh, we did increase our membership fees. And part of that was, uh, part of the sell on that to our members was that they would see improvements at our recreation centers, which included the pools, uh, as well as have some other bells and whistles that justified the increase. So that's kind of hanging out there. And I'm sure our members will eventually remember that when things start to go back to normal and say, hey, what's up? Is there any questions on the projects or I go too fast? Are you guys still with me? I see Ron raising his hand. I only see four of you, so please just speak up. Victoria's got her hand going around. <laughs> oh, thank you. I couldn't, I couldn't unmute. Um, okay, I know that the commission did research into the uh, what people wanted regarding gate card readers at the dog park, and I know we discovered that really nobody seemed to want it. So then it went to the the uh, council and did the council add that back in? Because I thought we eliminated it. 
I think it was the commission's uh, part of the report was that no, we didn't want to do anything with the dog park, but because it was on the list, it was prior to the commission. That's why it dropped all the way to the bottom. So we probably yeah. will never get down to that. Right, because if that if it, if that comes up, would it come back to us to look into it again? Because I I know that that wasn't something that we were interested in. If we get down to 19, 20, 21, and 23, I would be amazed. But if we do, right. yeah, I, I would imagine the commission's going to get involved with that again and hear from the community. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Mark. On the bottom, I saw the asterisk that said the Community Service Commission request amount <clears throat> that has been removed, but they weren't removed. Just the dollar amount was removed from the grand total. Is that what it's reading? So the request item to be removed was, yeah, so that's going to be the girls softball that came into one of the meetings and basically said, we know you guys have a lot of projects to fund here. We don't want to be greedy. So what their big motivation or their big request was to do the restroom. So at the request of the girls softball organization, it requested that the scoreboards remove. But it, since again, since it was on that original list, we didn't want to take it off and then present it to the council. So like to your point, gate readers Victoria, is also listed there and was requested to be removed, but it was still on the list. Does that answer your question, Ron? Yeah, it does. I, and I do have to say, I'm, I'm a little concerned about a couple of the items, but that's okay. I mean, you know, parking lot paving for the Little Paz dog park, I think that amount is very low. It's the reason why it wasn't done originally. It's why it's got DG in the parking lot. And uh, security cameras, yeah, we we hear that all the time that they need it to be there. My concern is once you put it there, other parks, people are going to be asking for it too. You look at the Norman P. Murray Community Center, any activity, I won't say any activity, lots of activities when people aren't walking their dogs. Cars, let's face it, are getting broken into. I think that's a slippery slope once you start talking about security cameras places. I mean, they're needed, but I don't, I'd just be concerned. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Well done on your presentation too. One other thing I want to highlight on this, at the time we brought this before the commission, we had some ideas of estimates for the projects, but the whole point behind uh, this prioritization was to do it based on community need. It wasn't supposed to be uh, based on the dollar amount. And the reason behind that is, and a good example would be the Marguerite Aquatics Complex before that was renovated. If we based it based on cost, Marguerite Aquatics Complex would always be at the bottom because it was so much money to renovate. So we wanted to do this primarily on need, and then as the money comes in, then we slowly fill it, and then when all the money's there for it, we, we do the project. That was the intent. But of course, when it goes to the council, the council took your recommendations. They made a couple of changes, um, but for the most part, they've been using this as a, a, a goal of what to achieve each year. I'm happy to see that Montnoso is still number one. Uh, Mark, on number five, where you took it down. Sorry, I can pull it back up. That's okay, because I know what the numbers is. Either 150 or 105 parking spaces. Is that the same place we were going to originally put the dog park in that park where it was an old maintenance facility yard? Yeah, it, yeah, I think it is. That was before my time when that location was looked at. Um, but I believe from my recollection, yeah, it was behind there. There was some storage, there's some storage containers back there, and then there's a slight uh, increase or incline all the way to the reservoir. I can tell you that that was one of the top three parks that we ended up naming. And as soon as the softball world heard about it, those that aren't aware, they went ballistic because they say that the softball players get recruited there. They have scouts out there playing while they're playing and went ballistic because somebody had told them we were gonna put the dog park right there. We were gonna take away one of their fields, which was not the case. So anyway, it was interesting. During that time though. So, yeah. All I right. have a question. Yes, I have go a for question, it. Mark? Mark? I have a question, can you hear me? 
You have the floor, Josh. Go for it. Thank you. Um, if we were, I was noticing, you know, about like a, uh, a car gate key or something like that. Wouldn't that end up being a nightmare if we had some kind of card they had to put in or keys or? <clears throat> we discussed that at previous meeting. That was one of the issues. But yeah, the, car, the dog. So yeah, and he does yeah. have it out. So it was it was being supposed to be removed. Oh, okay, okay. I can just see that being a nightmare. But, yeah, yeah, the recommendation from the commission was not to entertain the idea of adding card readers at the dog park. Okay. You know, if if that ever gained momentum, you would have to do some research on the best way to administer that program, without a doubt. That was not yeah. figured out at the time. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I'm going to jump into the programs and services. Uh, what I'm going to highlight first is, I think, uh, what was in the report, just to kind of highlight what we cut out of our current fiscal year that we're not offering. So let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, on this page here, you'll see the programs and services cut. This is, for the most part, everything that we cut from the current fiscal year due to COVID because it was canceled. We can't have group gatherings, things like that, or our facilities, our modified hours, there just isn't time to do it. Mark, but for the most part, is yes. this exhibit A that you're talking about? Yes. My screen is, is gray. Uh, maybe I'm the only one that it just says that you're sharing it, but I don't see anything on there. Mark, right, I'd like to unshare and reshare your, your item. Okay. I don't have it either. I mean, I have it on my other computer over here, but I don't have it on that screen. I don't either. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's showing. It's all gray. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm I'm freezing right now. So I'm going to use this as a quick break. I've got to close, close it and get back into it. Uh, but for this one, since it's in your attachment, while I do that, I can start to talk to it, and then I'll pull up the Excel spreadsheet. So some of the programs that we were unable to offer this current fiscal year were programs like Bunny Days, Hometown Halloween, uh, Breakfast with, Visits with Santa, and that was not only due to COVID, but also uh, as a budget reduction. Uh, it was an easy one for us to make because Saddleback Unified School District uh, indicated that they were no longer able to offer those programs. So when we renewed their agreement, those were reduced from their contract and they focused primarily on the Kids Factory program. Uh, other activities that we have were the concerts on the green, the prelude in the park, fall movies, Patriot Day, we've had some fundraising events like Paddle for the Battle, Relay for Life, uh, Rally for Life, a lot of our senior socials. Pretty much any time we had a group, those programs were gone. Some bigger programs included uh, the Yard After School program that we had offered at uh, Felipe for the students over at Carl Hankey. And then we also had recently started a new one over at Los Alisos for some homework help. Um, at that school. So those, when schools closed, of course, those programs also closed and they have not been able to return back. At our recreation centers, we had various classes. Um, well, all of our classes really was Okay, we lost Mark temporarily. Um, he's gonna come right back in, so just give him just a moment. Lydia, could you have shared Exhibit A since you're a co-host or Drew? That probably would yes. work. Let me see uh, if I can share my screen here. Let me see here. One second. Share. Yeah. All right, are you seeing it now? No. Oh, there it is. Yes, yay. Okay. 
Now Mark can come back. <laughs> <laughs> Talked himself right out of the meeting. So let me see here. So Got I've it. and lost it. Am I, am I still here? There we go. There so we yeah. Go. There we go. So yeah, I think he wanted to give you basically a general feel for everything that's been canceled um, so far this year due due to COVID. Um, let me see here. What else do I got? But yeah, you can see it's a, it's a lot. And too many over. Are you guys seeing all this stuff? Yeah. Here you're actually sharing your web yes. screen right now. <laughs> hey, Mark. There he is. You're muted. Can't see anything right now, Drew. All right. Well, now I see gray. Isn't that a song? All the screens are gray? Well, Drew had it up for a minute. Ah. Uh. Yeah, I'm having some tech issues here too. My apologies. If I could just get to here, I'll stop sharing. Are you guys still shit? Stop sharing. Okay. Sorry about that. You're muted, Mark. There it is. <laughs> is that an applause? Go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I, I I let you guys see it for a minute. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. So there's some of the events that I highlighted. Uh, thanks for pulling that up, Drew. The you know family campouts on there, all the quarterly activities that we did at our recreation facilities, like pumpkin dive, the luau, the cardboard boat derby, things like that. Um, we even, the Kids Factory program for the summer got dropped. Uh, so moving forward, if these events are also dropped in the next budget, uh, like I said, I don't know if I got cut off or not, but we're trying to get some feedback on where we should focus our attention as we start to come out of this and as funds become available, where should we you know, prioritize that? And that's why I sent you that spreadsheet, the cost analysis for the programs. So Drew, I'm going to pull that up. If you can stop sharing this one, I'm going to pull up the other one. Thank you. All right, so this is the Excel spreadsheet that I sent you. I hid some of the columns just so we would have uh, everything condensed into one space. And I know it's probably small on your screens. So in the first tab that I sent you, they were so, so uh, sorry, sorted rather by the full cost. That included, you know, all the supplies, our HST staff, and our full-time staff. And so that was column L. Uh, that's cost per participant with staff costs. So that's how it was sorted. So you can see um, some of the programs and services are listed there in the correct order. Soccer of Hope and Bunny Days are crossed out because we haven't been able to offer those uh, lately. So, but I wanted to put them in there and just in case they ever came back or we were asked to do them. These are ones that potentially could make a comeback uh, in some capacity. Uh, so if, as you look down there and you look at the cost per participant, uh, it starts, you know, with our community CPR lifeguard course, it's at $59.11. Now that's a negative number, which means we're actually making uh, a profit on that. And that profit goes to help running the facilities, which facility costs are not in here. So in the grand scheme of things, we're not really making money on it, but when you just put the actual cost of the supplies and the amount we charge and the staff time that goes into it, we're doing much better that we are on this program than we are on some others. So as we go through this, I just want to highlight some of the programs. So we have, uh, we just talked about the lifeguards course, facility rentals at Montanoso. I mean, that's just renting with staff assistance. 
you know, whether it's birthday parties um, or special events and things over there that people want to come in and use. We've got our picnic shelters, which are Melinda Park and Flojo Park. We have summer camps. These came on uh, a few years ago. Lydia and her staff were able to start offering summer camp opportunities over at the Montanoso Recreation Center using the babysitting room. They went on excursions and stuff like that. There's an event or a program where we were actually seeing, uh, you know, it wasn't, we weren't subsidizing it. Senior services with like Elks Lodge, dinner dances, senior excursions, uh, drug awareness, prevention programs. I'm gonna go down these pretty quick. The Marine Lake Day, that's with the Marine Adoption Committee. Prelude in the park I wanna pull out because this is just our portion of that event. If you were to, we, this is not for the citywide. So the Prelude in the Park and the Pacific Symphony event is a much greater number cost-wise and staff-wise, but this is just our portion of it from our department that was removed from the budget. So this included like the carnival games, this included you know, prizes, any of those family fun activities prior to the concert starting. Uh, community services grant funding. So this is going to come to you guys next month. It's our two month meeting. It's March and April. So this is the, uh, these are all the nonprofits, the social services groups that come to us ask for funding. And then the commission allocates the amount for each group and then makes a recommendation to council. This is, I'm trying to think of some of the organizations off the top of my head. The one that I think of is like the Shea, um, Therapeutic Writing Center down in San Juan that services Mission Viejo uh, individuals with disabilities. They can go down there and ride horses and things like that. This is South County Outreach. This is Stand Up for Kids, um, the organization that helps uh, Kate and helps youngsters, youth who are homeless uh, get resources and things like that. The Mission for the Armed Forces event. This is our partnership with the Mission Viejo High School Football Boosters, where they honor uh, different vets. I believe, actually, Ron was one that got recognized down there one year. And uh, it's a really cool program where each of the varsity members have the name of their veteran on the back of their jersey, and they play the whole game like that. And there's all kinds of uh, activity for, during, and after the football game, uh, and really focusing just on our vets and showing our appreciation. Our portion of this is to help with some of their marketing and also to cover the cost of the jerseys that the the, um, the vets get. So the jersey on the that goes on the athlete and then the actual veteran gets the jersey. Four Corners holiday display, that's at Crisanta and La Paz. That's just decorating the four corners there with working with the different uh, religious groups. You guys know what some of these are, so I'm gonna skip them. <laughs> so Relay for Life, that's another partnership that we have with that committee. That isn't a city event. Uh, it's one that we support uh, and we provide them with in-kind support as well as we help offset some of their costs, uh, their logistics costs. Usually it's usually the stage, I believe, and some of the audio uh, equipment that they need to rent for that. Uh, we all know Julie Foudy coming in to teach soccer. I think everything else is pretty much self-explanatory. Talked about the SNAP initiative and elements to the event. So this isn't necessarily a one program. This is used to help provide elements at different events. So it's kind of spread out all over the map through all of our offerings. Is there any of these that stand out like, what is that? Why are we doing it? And then here's one that we haven't really talked about. So prior to COVID, we were on the, I mean, we were so close to putting on our very first esports tournament and starting up the league. We had an intern with us that was working with us to figure this out and had it all done. And then of course we had to cancel it due to COVID. But this was kind of like the next up and coming trend for recreation uh, departments is to start offering 
uh, gaming and esports online. So uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to jump back into that and get something going. And of course the rest of the programs. So again, just for point of reference, the L, that's how these were prioritized. It gives you the you know cost per participant. We go to where we're actually making something down to uh, this program, the therapy training program. And I'm going to point this out is, although we don't have direct revenue from this, we do have revenue from the membership. And so that's just kind of hard to calculate to figure out what that is in there. So that number should actually probably be a lot less. But at the time of putting this together, we didn't have a way to calculate how much revenue was coming in based on memberships. But the one right above it, you can see at the yard for Carl Henke and stuff like that, that is, you know, that's fully subsidized. That was a free program we offered. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about Los Alisos. There's one in here for Los Alisos. This one right here, Los Alisos. That was a free program we offered to the participants. There wasn't really much cost to us for staffing, but we did contract out a teacher to do the homework help and stuff there. So. It just kind of gives you a variety. It kind of puts things into perspective of what we are spending on these programs per participant and trying to give you two different tables to look at when you provide your input. Now we could totally sort it a different way. Jumping over to the second tab, this was sorting the programs by, well, basically all the costs except for full-time staff. And my thought for doing this, this is gonna be column M, my thought for doing this is, you know, regardless of full-time staff being involved in these programs, if they're not involved with these programs, we're gonna assign different responsibilities to them. So in my opinion, the full-time staff costs are, you know, a constant and they get divvied up and they fluctuate, whatever. Uh, we'll use that on our side for how much staff time is being dedicated to different programs. But for this purpose, I thought it would be good to just see more of the actual cost for each of the programs. So, and it does change the order quite a bit once you pull out the full-time staff costs. So if I remove this, kind of shrinks it up there a little bit. So it gives you the different order. So hopefully you guys were able to go through that and figure that out on how they were prioritized in the system. Um, but I always like to go down to the bottom too see what's there. So on this one, some of the higher number of costs per participant, when you're looking at just uh, with HST costs and stuff like that, you'll see now the yard at Carl Hanke is still kind of down there. You know, we subsidize $413 for that program. The Kids Factory program is three, you know, we subsidize quite a bit for each of those programs. You know, it's 308 for the school year and 133. Kids Factory program, we've increased. We've been constantly increasing that year after year for, to put more of the cost onto the participant. But it's, it's at all of our elementary schools. Yeah, so that's why the costs for that are so high. Um, and then so on and so forth. So I'm not going to talk these again, but I would love questions because I'm rambling and I know it. Uh, or if you have initial thoughts. Yes. Josh Vecchioni does have a question. Um, he's unable to mute himself at the moment, but he sent me his question. Why do we grant $8,500 for grad night? So grad night, the, the thought behind grad night is, you know, part of recreation and community services is to support other programs and services in the community to keep our um, community engaged and safe. And so I think the reason why that started, and this isn't, just unique to Mission Viejo, a lot of cities fund their grad night is to make sure that the kids have a safe place to go after grad night so they don't come up with their own recreation. We wanna fund a program uh, that the kids can go to and participate and we know where they're at and they're safe and they're not doing something else. So that's why we do it. We've got four high schools in the city and it's based on a formula uh, based on how many students they have graduating that year that, and then the, that number gets divvied up, not equally, but based uh, their student body, that's how they get those funding. And they make requests. So each year we get the request. So eventually it just, we, and we always gave it to them. So we eventually just made it a line item in, the, in our budget. Okay, are there any other comments?
I can't see you, so if anybody sees anybody waving your hand, please tell me. Mark. I have a question. Mark, is uh, line item uh, 37 on tab two, can we get a better deal from the guy that puts that on? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, movies in the park. So that's a, a program that we do in-house. We own our own uh, movie equipment and Adam Chio actually is the one that has taken the lead with that. So no, that's that's our hard cost. We own the equipment and that's staffing to do it and any supplies and stuff on it. So we don't contract that event out to anybody. So there's no room to reduce it. Is there any way, I know uh, Pam said she got you guys to print it out. Is there any way to get this printed out? It's really hard to read on the iPad and I have no way of printing it. Sure, yeah. I, uh, yes, if you want a hard copy, we can definitely get you a hard copy. I would like a hard copy. So the whole intent of this was just kind of give you an overview, and I'm going to go back to the whole report now, not get off the programs and services, is to really show you or paint a picture what our department is currently in and what we're going to be facing as we start to make recommendations for our budget. We've got a whole list of CIP projects that need to get done. We've reduced a bunch of program services and events already from our budget. Our facilities are operating on an average about 50% uh, operating hours. Uh, and we've got staff vacancies. So we've got some challenges ahead of us. And so as you start to listen to people out in the community and you start to you know digest all this information, we really do wanna hear your input of what you're hearing from the community or what your individual thoughts are. So as we build our plan to come out of this, like I said, it's not going to be a light switch and all this stuff goes back. Some of this may never, ever come back, but it would be great to have your input um, and your support as we move forward. Um, and that's why I wanted to present this. Hopefully this kind of gives you an overview of you know, the, what we're facing and we'll see where we go from here. Will this be something that will come up on our, our agenda again for our meeting? Probably not, unless you needed it to, but no, I don't think the council's asking for any recommendations on this. The CIP's already been approved by the commission and they're not asking for us to revisit that. The facility hours might come back um, if we were going to make that changes or I could use any comments that we received tonight or down the road. Programs and services will be on us to do it. Um, what's the other one that I'm missing? I think that's it. Staffing and you, you guys aren't involved with staffing, so. It just depends, it could. Yes, Pam. Um, I have a question. This is a really probably silly and as, as a layman, but do they, do, does the council give you an X amount of do, a dollar amount that you have to cut by? Or is this at your discretion? Like, okay, we're gonna cut, 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 cut. How does, how does that work? So it's really up to, I mean, we get our marching orders from the city managers. So the way it works is uh, between the city manager and our administrative services or finance director, they kind of do the projections on revenue. So this is a multi-stage budget preparation period. The first one is where do we think our revenues are gonna be? And that's property taxes, that's you know hotel tax, gas taxes, revenues from our department across the board. Okay, this is how much we think we're gonna bring in. All right, well then that's how much money we have to spend, right? because we as staff want to go to the city council with a balanced budget and say, this is what we're able to offer based on our revenues. And so they go through and we, depending on the different departments, we all put in our initial budget and then we usually get the, hey, everything looks great, but we're this or you know whatever, or we have this much money left that we can allocate. And so at that point, we all kind of work together and we get direction from the council on their priorities. And then that's where the money is allocated to create the budget. Okay. And for what it's worth, I kind of agree with what Ron said, plan number two on the hours. I kind of agree that you can't be manipulating the hours because people can't keep that straight. I, I think of one standard set of hours and adjusting that. That's just my opinion on that too. I have to agree with Ron on that one. 
All right, thank you. Yeah, Mark, me too. Um, the comments that I've gotten the community is they're confused about, like they'll show up and go, oh, it's closed. When is it? Oh, it's Tuesday. That, so I think the option two, I would agree, it, just staying consistent um, would be a better option, a less confusing for the community. And my other quick thought, which thank you, Caitlin, for bringing it up, because I, when there's a screen on, I couldn't unmute, is um, um, since we have so many cutbacks, and I know the reason we're doing grad night, because um, I know I've worked on that with Leslie, is, um, you know, I was class president two years, and we raised the money for grad night, and, and you know, had a price for the tickets, and did it in the gymnasium, and did that. I would rather see that money put in the CSF funding because I know we've decreased that to these nonprofits that are really serving the community, you know, like Stand Up for Kids and Kids, you know, and Family Ministries. Um, it's just a thought. I think we we've, we've done it in the past, and maybe it was a good gesture. But I think now maybe we can allocate that money to somewhere else. Or maybe bring back some programs we had to cut or something. It's just my opinion on that. Yeah, and that the money dedicated for grad night is definitely does not cover their grad night. It's just a drop in the bucket to help them with their fundraising goals. But okay, noted. You know, I and on the other hand, I also was a parent that put together grad night when my son graduated from high school for mission. And I know that they did need the funds and they did because you, you still have limited volunteers as parents. So grad night is an important event. And I mean, maybe we need to relook at it and talk to the, the schools and see really what they need or if they need anything or if they can cut back. But until we know that I, grad night is important and they don't always have the money. So uh, I hate to see it cut. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> it's okay. I don't want to see really. I, I just feel that, you know, the school, the school stepping up and doing, we did fundraisers all year long and that money was set aside for the senior activities. And I, I don't know, think it's really going to be an issue because grad night's probably going to be canceled. Yeah, that's true. So we don't uh, even need to. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can't do that either. So. Yeah. They'll do. Yeah. Something for the yeah, game. yeah. It's low on the low on the totem pole. Are there any so other look, comments? Just one more question to see if this will generate any additional input from you is you know there's a whole laundry list and it's not going to be easy to you know pick one thing over the other. But maybe if we could categorize some things together, what do you think? Like if you had to say some of the sports like tennis and pickleball or senior services or you know family events or citywide events like what do you think your priority what do you think the community's priority would be what you know is there duplication with some of the services and programs that we're offering that you know maybe those can drop because yeah there's another program out there that somebody's offering uh you know what are your thoughts on that well, it's not on the list, but um, I'd really like to see the city do something for 4th of July. Uh, say that again. I'd really like to see the city do something for 4th of July. Something where they can partner with the lake and do something. I don't know what that would look like, but... Specifically for this year? Yeah. So this year, I know that's, and that's kind of a different category, and I didn't put those on here with the Mission right. Bay Committee, but, um, you know, this year, I believe the commitment from the Activities Committee is, you know, the street fair is going to be canceled, but they are still interested in doing a fireworks show of some kind, whether it's at right. the Athletic Park or somewhere else in town, uh, if possible. The big concern there is if, you know, social distancing is still a thing, how do we manage people? Uh, yeah. And then moving forward, they also had the Holiday Boutique, uh, which is normally hosted at the Murray Center. But if the Murray Center is still closed by then, are they going to host it outside? And I don't think there's much interest in doing that. And then, of course, Santa's Arrival is the other big one. Uh, and all the holiday activities, whether, you know, letters to Santa, um, home decorating contests, things like that. I, 
the letters and home decorating contest is will still go and it's just a matter of where we are in this pandemic if Santa's arrival will return or if they'll do a modified program like they did this past year with the stop wave and go program which was pretty successful and pretty popular so there will be something there um, yeah the problem the separate. is we're still in COVID and we don't know exactly when it's going to end the vaccines are going to be kicking up and hopefully more people will get them but how, how do you really plan something? Because we're looking at one year, right? We're looking at just getting through this year and what we can do for this year. I mean, next year, I'd like to think that we're at the end of it and that we can seriously look at bringing stuff back. But at, at the end, when we have a window, it would be really wonderful if there is something we can do as a city to help celebrate opening things up again once we can and come together as a city and give people a go or do something. I know we can't do the the concerts in the park because that has to be all planned and everything. Yeah, and all, all the late concerts are probably not gonna happen either. No, no, it, it's too late for that. Victoria, the I problem would... is, and Kathy can support me on this, it's just like the boutique. I mean, stuff has to be starting now for that, those, those deals. Okay. And we learned last year. I mean, we were down to how many days, Mark, for Irish Fest? Uh, yeah, a couple of days. And we had to pull the plug on that. And we did the same thing with 4th of, 4th of July. So is it better not to do it in this in this this time rather than, oh, we're going to have it and then pull the plug again? That That's kind of crummy on people, too. No, so, a, we, we can't really plan on anything no. like this. It would be nice to be able to have something. And I have no idea what it is. I, I It yeah. just out of it but to have something that we can come together as a city to to celebrate I, even if it's a, a ceremony or a, something that we can do that's a, hopefully relatively inexpensive but it kind of is a a statement that we are coming back and the parks are going to be open because that's the biggest complaint i get is from people who i think they don't really think but they complain that the parks are closed and they pay taxes and you try to explain, well, they're trying to protect you and your children, but some people don't want to hear that. So it would be a celebration of reopening and the restaurants and stuff like that. I, I agree with Victoria. I think that we should be looking to the future. We don't know the date that this is going to end and open up and things going on, but I would love to see some kind of family friendly event that everybody could go to, not some of the smaller ones with, you know, um, build a cardboard boat. I mean, I, that's great. I love that. I love that event, but not everybody can participate. So if we can kind of think in our heads, something that we could do, we don't know the time frame, so we don't really know what it's going to be, but I would love to see a family friendly event that be the first thing that comes back. Could we do a tailgate something, a tailgate, you know, watch the fireworks, but tailgate party or? What about like drive-in movie theater? If Saddleback's closed. Can't we use Saddleback's parking area, whatever, do a movie night, drive-in movie? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm we, just throwing. We did a yeah, birthday we did a, party. We uh, did a drive-in movie that was pretty successful yeah. last year. I know a company, we actually did it at the birthday party at the funeral home. We had the giant, giant screen that blows up. Took them about 45 minutes to set it up. And we had 30 cars parked like tailgate and they watched the movie on a giant screen. I don't know, maybe. Well, it should be something that we could really in include a lot of people. Mark, have you guys yeah. talked about anything? Trying to do something or is it just the slow open and business as usual when we can do it is there well going to our be priority no we have not our priority has been to get our facilities back open and to get people engaged with that i think our next uh kind of our next goal is to try to get some of our contracted classes back uh and fitness programs you know classes that we can do social distance uh following the social distancing guidelines out in our parks not in our facilities but out in our you know, outside of the rec centers or in our parks, like yoga or, you know, chair aerobics, tai chi, line dancing, boot camps, you know, things like that, that you can do safely outside. 
it's the stuff inside the building that we, you know, there's no, we don't know when we're going to be able to do that stuff again. But at least that's a way to engage. And so between those classes and trying to engage some senior services, again, we're going on a year where older adults have been stuck in their homes. Right. We need to get them re-engaged in some capacity. So, uh, you know, as the vaccines keep going, you know, get them, get them, get them, get them, so we can get them out here and engaged and, and participating in some stuff again. Are you guys looking at a, a date? Is the city kind of feeling like maybe fall we're going to be actually much more active or do you have any uh, sense for this? No, we don't really. I think from a, a city standpoint, I think we've written off any big gatherings through the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, and and most okay. likely through the end of this, you know, 2021. As much as we wanted 2020 to be gone and stuff, I, we're not going to bounce right back in 2021. Right. So, uh, but I think through the end of December, for sure, it's it's going to be hard to get any big group gathering stuff uh, again. Uh, so to look, looking through the end of December and kind of feeling like what what is important to start to reopen before the end of December as we're able to. Well, I mean, and that I mean, there's we're we're not going to be out of this for a little while, but you know, I, you're saying that you don't think that it's going to happen probably through Christmas. So what are we actually looking at opening before Christmas? Or are we looking at 2022? We're looking at 2022, I think is to be realistic is 2022. But as you know, as opportunities come, you know, as we move back up into the tiers, whether we go to red or orange or whatever, and there's an opportunity to do it, I think what I'm coming to, what we're coming to as staff to you is like, okay, well, if in July, you know, we enter a different tier and we're able to do a little something and we have a little bit of money to do something, where should we put that money? Where should we put our resources into doing? As of right now, our goal is to do the outdoor classes and to engage our seniors somehow. We don't know what that looks like yet, but that's, you know, that's kind of our direction is what we want to do. Uh, but based on comments that we received tonight now, I can see that we want to do some kind of community, hey, we're still open type activity. Uh, that's, you know, rather than focus on smaller programs, we want to do something where everybody in the community, whether it's a drive through or a drive in movie, uh, or Liddy's always wanted to do a dry boat parade. <laughs> she might get her parade. Um, you know, things like that. We'll have to get creative or we'll need to take existing programs and modify them. Wow. Okay. Mark, um, Josh can't unmute. He was wondering if you could send us all the hard copy of that look that sheet that you just said you'd send to uh victoria yeah the spreadsheet spread. you wanted in yeah paper. yeah okay, yeah sure you could do that yes thank you so maybe, um you want to bring a parade back to the city When Mark hired me, he said that he wanted to know what my number one wish would be. And I said that um, I wanted to have a parade. And he said, parades are really expensive. And I said, yes, but our parade would be very unique. It would be dry boats that all get to dress up and you get to be on the boat. And it's kind of like a float parade, but without water. It's amazing. Villa Park does it uh, during the holidays. And everybody who has a boat, boat decorates their boat as a float. And then they go driving down all the hills of Villa Park and everybody has lights on and it's the coolest show ever. And it's super fun. And I think that Marguerite is a perfect avenue for it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always wanted to <laughs> That would be noted. We've noted a parade. That would be the only boat I can go on. <laughs> One with wheels. <laughs> so this has been helpful for us. Again, so the highlights is going to be a community, you know, a community event. And then if, if you're all right, if you support the idea of engaging our seniors somehow, whether it's outdoor classes, um, you know, if the Murray Center were to get be able to open up early 
earlier than later, then I think that's what we would focus on is, you know, fitness and that social interaction, of course, with social distancing for them, but we've got to get them engaged. Have you had, what, what's the feedback from the seniors? Because I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of seniors that, hey, I don't want to go work in the bookstore. You know, I don't want to do that. They're still pretty, pretty scared of all this. Have you heard anything from them specifically? Well, I'll let Drew talk to this because he interacts with them mostly on the, the activities in the park at market and stuff. <clears throat> A high level, it's it's a mixed bag. You've got people that want to be engaged, and you've got some that don't want to even step outside their door. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, you know, is there? I a lot of the people I talk to are kind of like, "Hey, we, we want back in the building." To heck with this, you know. Recall the governor and get me back doing what I used to do. I mean, that's. I mean, you hear a lot of that kind of stuff, and. And we're, our hands are a little bit tied in that, you know, you look at like sports and, and the things that we maybe want to do. We have insurance requirements. We can't really move past what those tiers are that are directed by the governor. We, you know, we get people that say, hey, you know, let's, let's have a big soccer tournament and, you know, tell the governor to shove it. And I'm like, well, we can't, even if we wanted to do that, we can't do that. You know what I mean? And and like the bocce, you know, they want a big bocce tournament or, you know, they, they, people want to go back to doing what they used to do. I mean, is really what we hear a lot of. So we're, as soon as we're able to do that stuff, we'll do it. I mean, but a lot of it, quite frankly, you know, we have risk management requirements. A lot of it's not up to us necessarily to sort of push the boundaries. Um, but this, when we have the drive through events, everyone says, oh, my gosh, this is so great. We're so happy to see you. I mean, some of you are at the trivia event. And people just, like Mark said, they want to be engaged. They, they, want to, they want that social interaction, you know, more than anything and do fun things. And, and uh, most of them just want back inside the Murray Center. I mean, we hear a ton of that. So we, we're doing best we can with, with what we're able to do. So we'll, we'll keep, you know, moving things forward. Yes, Josh. Can't hear you, buddy. Muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, would this sound crazy, but let's say we opened up something. Could, you know, when you get your vaccination, you get a card. Would it be crazy to say, hey, we're having an event, but you have to bring your vaccination card and prove you are vaccinated? Would that be too out, out of space to ask for that or too much of a problem? I mean, I don't know that we want to be the very first people to do something like that. Mark, I'll let you answer, but I mean, and not to say it won't happen. Well, to Drew's earlier point is we're limited on what we can do based on our, you know, our insurance too. So even though that might be a requirement, I mean, schools are talking about it. There's, you know, airplane, don't you have to do it when you travel and stuff? You have to show that you're vaccinated or at least not um you know, you show a test that you are not positive. So there's things that we could potentially put in place that would be an interesting concept instead of your membership card, show your vaccination card. Uh, but it's definitely something we can explore and see. And as we network with other agencies, see what they're doing. You know, my mother's in Costa and her and her friends say the same thing. It's just, they have no, they are not leaving the house. They have nowhere to go. They're less frightened than I think younger people. These are people in their 70s and 80s, but they're disappointed that they can't socialize. They can't be with people. My mother just wants to go be with somebody other than me. I'm boring. So, yeah, I, I think the senior thing is very important. Anything you can do for this where they can actually get out. I know that her friends, my mother does not drive anymore. So it would have to be something they could do without having to drive or getting a ride in another way. I think most seniors, once they've got their second shot, I can tell you I'm so excited, but I have to wait till the 21st to be fully excited because it's say 10 days after your second dose. I'm a senior and I can tell you when I've hung out at SoCo when my son was given shots, when I was at Disneyland, when I got my second shot, once those people get their second shot, the seniors are ready to go out and party. They think they are, seriously, they are ready. 
because they've been cooped up. Our 90, 95 year old tenant told me he can't wait for a second shot so that he can go back out and do things. And it's pretty pathetic when you're 95 years of age, you can't do anything because you've been cooped up, but he's ready. I can tell you, I'm ready. I'm excited. That's speaking as a senior, even though I'm not the senior appointment on this commission. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, and we're, we're very much on top of, you know, what we're allowed to do and, and, you know, the tiers and every little detail in those tiers. And so we're keeping, we'll be moving things forward as, you know, as quick as we can. I mean, that's, that's the plan. So. And the resources, we need the resources to be able to do it, whether it's budget or staffing and stuff like that too. So it's, yeah, all these, we've got great ideas. Our staff are very creative and they come up with some great things. You guys always suggest great things. It's just a matter of having the means to be able to do it. But this initial feedback has been great. I really encourage you guys, if you think of something in the middle of the night, shoot me an email or a text or something like that. And we can pull that into our, uh, plan as we move forward. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments here? Okay, then let's go on to new business. Give me a second. Okay, we get the we have the opportunity to appoint. Are we appointing two people? Caitlin or Mark? Yes, yeah, so sorry, the, the Wall of Recognition Ad Hoc Committee, this is something we do every year. The Wall of Recognition, you get your applications in by the end of February. They are reviewed by this initial committee and the initial committee is made up of uh, two commissioners from this commission and then one representative from each of the other committees, Heritage Committee, Community of Character, and Cultural Arts Committee, and the Senior Activities Committee. And that makes up uh, the initial group uh, to review the applications. So this is like the highest recognition you can get. If you're on this board, you are like creme de la creme. Uh, you have made the most lasting uh, impression on Mission VAO. You have contributed. It's not designed for somebody that donate, you know, walks their neighbor's dog every Wednesday and Friday for the last 20 years. This is, you know, you've made some impactful changes in our community and have um, made a difference. So. And we are honored because on our commission, we actually have a, a recognized person, right? Commissioner Allen? And Thank you very much. <laughs> so first of all, I think that who would like to be on the committee, the ad hoc committee? Raise your hand. Yeah, I would be John. interested in doing that. Yeah. You know what? I think it would be awesome if our two newest members that have never I would, been on the I'll, Yeah, I'm good with Did, it too. Got it. I got your Yay. hand. I didn't know whether you could see it. I'm okay. like, okay. I know. I know. I'm not. That's why I, I do this. Okay. Okay, so let's go with uh, Commissioner Gonskowski and Bechion. And you guys do have to have the hardest names. You really do. <laughs> right. But I think that on it. I think that's a great, a great thing for you to do. So yeah. you're contacted about meetings and such, right, Mark? Yeah, so at the end of February, once we get, if we get any applications, there was one year we did not, uh, but if we do get applications and they meet the requirements, we'll pull the group together and you will be the two representatives from this commission, along with those other committee representatives to make a recommendation uh, to this commission on whether or not they should uh, advance or not. And then this commission will review them and make a recommendation to the council. And if the council okay. blesses, then they go on the wall. Uh, okay. Mark, I know that there are some nominees coming in, so you will have nominees. Excellent. Okay. All right, I hear a motion to appoint uh, our two commissioners. Got so moved. Awesome. This actually doesn't need a motion. You just get to appoint as the chairperson for the committee. So you get all the power. Awesome. I don't get very much power, so I love it when I get it. Okay, guys, congratulations. You'll love it. 
Okay, and that takes us to commissioner comments. Am I am I correct? Starting with Commissioner Gonskowski. I'm sorry, it's getting tired. I've had a really long day. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Hey, for the longest time, I thought my husband had a Z in his name until we actually got married. I'm like, oh, there's no Z. It's an ant. <laughs> so, anyways. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, for me, the, the first couple of weeks were great. I met with Mark one-on-one -on -one and he was, you know, giving me a very insightful, um, you know, what, what's required and cause we kind of went into it blind really. It was like, oh, we'll sign up and then, oh, this is what you're actually going to be doing. So I've never really done anything like that before where I signed up not knowing exactly what my role would be, but, uh, Mark was uh, very informative. And then we also had a day where Josh and I went with Mark around to uh, the Aquatic Center, which was is very impressive. And uh, the Norman P. Murray, it looks beautiful. The new carpeting, um, all the, the fixtures and everything, it looks nice and fresh and clean. So perfect timing, actually, you know, if there is a silver lining in this, you know, it's not being used it's you know you're not going to have a lot of people complaining that it's closed because of renovation so there you know there are some silver linings and the one thing i i have to say we also went around to um the rec centers the one thing i took away was all the staff they are so passionate about what they do it's not a job for them it's like this is this is what i want to be doing they're so excited to tell you what they're doing and the stories that just, you know, th that they accommodated, you know, a resident that is, you know, kind of overweight and they need to get into the pool and they put benches so he can walk step by step, you know, and take a rest in between to get him out, you know, and get him going somewhere. I mean, and that to me was just like, Oh, you're just not like a 24 hour fitness where you just sign in and yep, yep, we don't care who you are. They really made a difference to somebody's life. And that, that just passion was definitely the takeaway for me from going around the, the different locations. So uh, I, I was thrilled and I'm thrilled to be part of this group, um, learning more about it and just being excited about, wow, we do live in a fantastic, I mean, I knew I lived in a fantastic neighborhood, but now it, it just really hits home. So I was thrilled. And thank you, Mark, for your time. <coughs> Excellent, Tricia. Thank you. Commissioner Roof. I'm proud to say that I get to tour with Mark on Thursday. Thanks, Mark. It'll be nice to see new things, see what's happened in the last years that I've been off. Uh, on February 8th, I attended the Laguna Nigel Community Service or Parks and Recreation Commission meeting <laughs> virtually. I, uh, it was interesting to see the way they ran the first meeting with the new commissioners. I'll be on Thursday. I'll be more than happy to share with Mark their agenda so you can see what they did and what they covered, which I thought was very interesting. Still waiting for my iPad. So those who complain that Victoria, that you only have an iPad, I don't even have an iPad. So there, um, and remember parks make life better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Ruth. All right, Commissioner Reich. You're muted. Parks make life better and love our town. Oh, short and sweet. Sorry, it took all my athletic dog out. Okay. Commissioner Smith. Hey, um, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to Melanie for her promotion to senior services supervisor i'm very happy for her. she's if you've met her for your newbies um she's just she's kind of like a dave borelli of the senior center you know she just is effervescent and just i mean she's she's going to be perfect for that um i attended the parking lot trivia we did that that the staff put on that was really fun um, I also helped at the crushing on our seniors with candles and candies the other day. So it was neat to see the seniors drive up and we gave them a little candle and a little thing of candy. So just like Mark said, they like to be kind of touch base with the staff and come through and wave and say hi. 
Um, I've been playing a lot of pickleball with the uh, players without partners. It sounds kind of like a single thing. I don't know. It doesn't. That's kind of a weird, weird name. But anyhow, um, and I love the new um, reservation system that you guys have gone to for the whole week for the pickleball reservations rather than the 24 hour thing. Much simpler. It's really, really made it made it really nice. So um, that's it. I think Kathy has something to share. I went, well, excuse me, Commissioner Allen. We did something together, but I'll let her. I'll let her share that with you. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Okay, Commissioner Bichione. Hello. Um, I wanted to also, you know, congratulate Melanie for, you know, her new position. Congratulations to her. She will be fabulous at Norman P. Uh, thank you again for Mark for the one-on-one -on -one we had and the private tour that we had together. That was great. Going to the two parks that I've never been to, living here over 50 years, it was it was um, interesting to go by and really it really got me excited about the improvements that hopefully we can do to some of these parks that are that are around. And something else that we talked about that I was excited about or diversity task force about possibly having a sign language interpreter for Memorial Day. Um, I know the few deaf in the community are very excited to um, possibly have, you know, a sign language interpreter present that they don't have to just read closed captions. So I'm really excited about that. So um and i um, excited to be uh, appointed to be on the wall of recognition. I know there's some wonderful people in our community that um, have done wonderful things and it would be great to recognize them. So um, got my second shot, uh, my vaccine. So I'm feeling good and um, my mom got it too. So she can't wait to go shopping and go to Burlington Coat Factory. So that's her two high things on her list. So. Beyond that, there you go. Thank you. Okay, Vice Chairperson Allen. Wow, what did I do? <laughs> First of all, I do want to congratulate Melanie. It's great to have her be a supervisor there at Norman P. It's going to be great for the seniors when they get back there. Um, they'll be welcomed with open arms and lots of love. Um, the day I took my mother to pick up meals at the age well, was the day they were passing out roses to them. You should have seen her. She was so excited she got roses. She said, why am I getting these roses? <laughs> I said, somebody loves you. <laughs> so she was very happy with that. So that was very good. Um, it was nice to see that memberships and reactivations are coming up with the more and more facilities opening up and more and more times people can go do things. So that was nice to see. And um, I too have had both shots, our whole household has. We had no problems from the second one, so we're good to go. Open something up so I can go someplace. <laughs> oh, and yeah, what Pam said we had to do. We, we went around to a bunch of parks, so we went and looked at a lot of parks, and some of the parks on that list were kind of like just open spaces with scrubs. So we were like, this is the park? Wait, wait a minute, is it here? So we were a little shocked by that. But anyways, it was a good tour, and Pam was the driver, so it was really good. <laughs> Thank you. I too am very excited about seeing stuff start opening up and I'm, I'm on lists. I have my husband's on one list for the vaccine. My mother's on the other list for the vaccine. Um, I'm still just a little underage to get it, but I have some pre-existing stuff. So I think I will be getting it pretty soon. Anyway, um, I am looking forward to it because in my household, there's a lot of health stuff in uh, we really have been staying at home. We've really been self-quarantining. And I really never want to hear the term self-quarantine or social distancing again. And I don't want to see all the little red dots on the floor. And I want to see people getting out and being a part of life again. So I'm looking forward to it. And I love that we were able to at least talk about it because that gives us hope. And hope is what we really need to hang on to. Um, I love this commission. I think you guys are all great. I love hearing the different ideas. Mark, you guys do such a great job. Drew, you know, Liddy, I want to go, I want to see a boat parade. Right? <laughs> so that's it for me. Parks make life better. 
See you next month, everybody. And we are adjourned. Stay safe. Bye. Everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Stay safe.